So um, today our speaker is Tim Tran. He is the epitome of an all-American success story. At the tender age of four, Tim, born Tran Mon Kim, became a refugee when he escaped communist North Vietnam by traveling with his parents on a U.S. Navy landing craft going to South Vietnam. In 1970, through the Agency for International Development, USAID, he received a scholarship to go to college in the United States. After two years attending Pacific University in Fort Stroud, Tim transferred to the University of California at Berkeley, where he graduated with a degree in business administration. As a condition of his scholarship, he returned to Vietnam in 1974, a decision he regrets, and landed a job in Saigon as an internal auditor for Shell Vietnam. When the communists took over Saigon in 1975, Tim's job changed from auditing to low-level clerical work, always under suspicion as a CIA agent for having studied in the U.S. In 1979, he escaped from Vietnam on a harrowing journey by boat to Malaysia and landed in Pala Padong refugee camp, where he was the camp's press secretary for visiting politicians, dignitaries, and the international press. He also volunteered as an interpreter for English-speaking delegations interviewing refugees for resettlement. In late 1979, Tim and his family arrived in Portland, Oregon, carrying all their belongings in a small plastic sack. Through a local newspaper, Tim landed a low-level accounting job with Portland's Johnstone Supply, a wholesale distributor providing a large selection of heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration parts, supplies, and equipment to contractors. Through his vision, ability, and hard work, Tim rose to the position of Chief Financial Officer at Johnstone. After retiring from Johnstone in 2003, Tim taught business courses at the college level for 12 years and was honored as 2004 Faculty of the Year by students at the University of Phoenix. Many articles have been written about Tim, including a feature in the CFO magazine. Today, he's a business consultant and a trustee of Pacific University. Libraries have always had a had a significant significance, has it had a special significance in Tim's life. They were a safe haven as a student in Vietnam during his college years at Pacific University, Cal Berkeley, and beyond. As a way of giving back to his adopted country, Tim and his wife Kathy established an endowment to fund operations for the Pacific University Library. And the library, built in 2005, was named, renamed Tim and Kathy Tran Library in their honor. Tim lives with his wife, Kathy, near Vancouver, Washington. When not involved in his consulting and philanthropic ventures, they like to read and travel, especially to our nation's national parks and residential libraries. American Dreamer is his um, book, and it's a remarkable debut, and if you haven't read it, it's available in Forest Grove at the uh, library here in Pacific's campus, and again on Amazon. So welcome, Tim. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Tim Tran. That's my American name. And I will explain to you why I picked that name. Because it's, the short story is, it's a discrimination, not racial, but gender discrimination. I will tell you a little story as I, I go along. I'm the author of American Dreamer. You probably seen this book, and so you may have read it. This little sticker right here is the latest award that I received. The award is called Read a Favorite First Place Winner. So that's my latest medal. Today, I would like to thank, first of all, Janet Peters and Bryce Baker for allowing me this opportunity to make a presentation to you. So to go ahead, I will click on the, this is the first time I've done this, click on the share screen and share. This is a picture of my father. At the age of 17, he, I ran away from home, enjoyed the fight for Vietnam's independence. And this is a picture of him as a guerrilla 
in the Vietnam military guerrilla led by Ho Chi Minh to fight for independence of Vietnam from the French. However, after fighting with the Viet Minh for a number of years, he realized that these communists just uh, uh, used the nationalist front to fight against the French, and they indeed were hiding their communist ideology. So he escaped. When the Geneva Agreement divided Vietnam into two parts, the North belonged to the communists, the South belonged to the nationalists at the 17 parallel. My mother took me from our village of Taiban, go to Haiphong and land and escape via a US landing craft. That was 1954. I was very seasick. So instead of go all the way to Saigon, my dad got off at Nha Trang uh, uh, so that I can rest and not being a crying baby all the way. So from Nha Trang, we later on moved to Tây Ninh, a town near the Cambodian border, and finally go to Saigon where he got a very good job with the Joint Chief of Staff. This is our family in Tây Ninh, the border, at the border of the Cambodian, uh, with the Ca Cambodia. That's my dad, my mom, myself, and my little sister and the second little sister. There's a little story about Tây Ninh that I need to tell you. A lot of people in Tây Ninh go to the jungle to uh, gather wood, bring it back to town and sell it you know, for a living. One day, I heard that one of the wood water gatherer was killed by a tiger. So that's really scared me off. And I avoid go, go to the uh, jungle area and just stay home. Well, the story goes, this is just a story. I don't know if it's true or not. The people in the entertainment say that if you got robbed by the tiger, all you have to do is squeeze the, its testicle. And then it will let you go. I don't know if it's true or not, but I never want to try that. The next picture is of me, as Janet mentioned, in 1970, I received a scholarship from the Agency for International Development to attend college in the US. And the top five of our group of 30 students I was sent to Georgetown University in Washington, DC. And that was an honor. And it gave me a lot of opportunity to visit the nation capital and spend most of my time going uh, to the museum and so on and so forth. One day, AID called me and the rest of the students to the office and mentioned, and they say that we are ready for college. So they sent my future wife, Kathy, and me to Pacific University. This is our picture at Pacific University, enjoying watching an eating contest on campus. Then I took the, I took the opportunity to show the fertility how This is Gamma Sigma. That's a picture of me sitting on the second from left next to the university faculty advisor and the rest of the half of the Gamma Sigma brother. And I love it. We didn't have the kind of hazing that we have these days. It's all very nice group of people. Then this is a picture of me and Kathy at 
Pacific University. This is our first snow in 1970. Just a wonderful picture. After graduating from, I transferred to UC Berkeley because I thought my life at Pacific University was too comfortable. I went to party almost every night and studying was pretty easy. I got good rates, so I thought I got to make the best of the situation. I transferred to UC Berkeley and graduated at UC Berkeley. According to the contract that I signed upon receiving the scholarship from AID, I have to return to Vietnam. The policy of the US at the time was one degree, then you return and help build your country. And that was a pretty good policy. And I supported it. The reason for that, may I make some comment here? The superpower. At the time, the US, the Soviet Union, the uh, China, and France, and England, Australia, like to provide scholarship to a limited number of top high school students to go to university at their country. And the condition that once they get a degree, they have to return to their country. So in other words, help to build the country, the economy, and also have a good, uh, you call it the yeah, relation of friendship with the host country. Let me give you another story here. When I was teaching at University of Phoenix, I was voted by student as faculty of the year. So the school gave us, hosted a luncheon, and I sat next to a gentleman who spoke English with an accent, just like me. So I asked him, where are you from? And he said, Cuba. And I asked, how did you get over here? And his answer was, he received as a top student from Cuba, high school student from Cuba. He received a scholarship to study college in Moscow, the Soviet Union. And the policy was one degree and you return home. So on his way to Canada, uh, go to Cuba, the plane, there's no direct flight, so the plane, you know, make a stop in Montreal. And he get off the plane, ask for asylum, and stay in Canada. Then he moved to the United States and became a faculty just like me at the University of Phoenix. So that to tell you that all superpower has the same policy. They hope that uh, my Cuban friend would support good relation with the Soviet Union from Havana, but that wasn't the case. Then when I returned to Vietnam, I have a, a jo very job, good job offer with Shell Oil Vietnam. And this is my uh, employee card. But I was under very high stress situation. My life became very dangerous. The common thought or suspect I was a CIA agent because I served, spent four years in the US, but they have more, uh, more concrete evidence. In my office at Shell, I sub, uh, my company, Shell Oil Vietnam, subscribed to a magazine, professional magazine called Journal of Internal Auditor. And the people who wrote article for that professional magazine use their designation CIA. Why? Because it stands for Certified Internal Auditor. The communists discovered that I have those magazines in my office. And they asked me to come down to the secu internal security for questioning. They asked me if I work for the CIA. I say, I never work for the CIA. They asked me what I did in the United States for four years. I said, I went to parties, I studied, watch, uh, watch football game and so on and so forth. 
And they, they said, we have evidence that you work for the CIA. I questioned what evidence they brought out one of the copy. And they say CIA right here. Then I say, you don't understand. This is a professional magazine. It's CIA stand for certified internet auditor. And they say, how, how, why, why do we have to believe you? And I told them you can you can go to go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Communist Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and ask what those designations mean. Well, they required me to write a confession, telling you know the whole thing about my relationship with that organization and designate CIA designation. I I wrote everything, and they just told me not to talk to anybody about that, which I kept quiet, but I knew my day is numbered, was numbered with the communists. So I escaped in 1979. This is Saigon. We took the, we pretend to be Chinese because at the time the communist, communist Vietnam and China had a war, border war in the North and communist Vietnam really discriminate the Chinese population. They collect gold dollars, confiscate their house and property and send them abroad in a very leaky, uh, non-seaworthy boat. So I pretend, my wife and I and the brothers pretend to be Chinese, go from Saigon to Radja and then cross the Group of Thailand to pull up Bidong. Uh, one footnote. With the, uh, during my trip, we were attacked by seven different sea pirate groups. They, they were Thailand fishermen. And one at a time, not all of them board the boat. So one at a time, one boat board our boat and rob the pressure of every valuable they have. The last group, which the seventh group, has nothing to rob. So I lost two things. Number one, they saw one of the pilots saw me wearing a Levi jean. And with the knife, he motioned me to take it off. And I did. So I lost my Levi jean. The second thing that they took was my prescription glasses. A very good pair made at Pacific University School of Optometry in 1974 when I returned to Saigon. They took us that too. And I understand that those things are very good secondhand uh, merchandise in the black market in Bangkok. So I didn't worry too much about losing my glasses or my Levi jean. I hope we will make it to Malaysia, which eventually we did, and stay at Bula Bidam. That's a refugee camp about 30 miles from the coast of Malaysia. This is my address at Bula Bidam. Boat number, that's my boat number, AG2174. This is a pretty interesting number, honor number, 426. That means that my boat is a 426 boat arrived in Mulabiram. When I arrived, the population of the refugee camp was about 35,000. And it's administered by the United Nations High Commission for Refugee uh, off the coast of Kula Trenganu, West Malaysia. I stay in the refugee camp for about four months. And thanks to these people, these are the picture of the American delegation. I interpret mostly for our chauffeur. He's right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, six from right. And the head of the delegation is Bruce Beasley. He was originally from the a uh, consul to Denmark in Copenhagen. 
I interpret for the American delegation in this picture, also the Australian and the Canadian population and any delegation that speak English. I also serve as press secretary. Uh, so I gave the correspondent Time Magazine, Life Magazine, News, Newsweek, uh, Time, uh, Life, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and politicians like Congressman Sula from New York. He was a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Representatives. He came to visit the camp and I gave him a tour and answer his question. This is the, the stove. I have a neighbor, a Chinese neighbor, who knew this stove to make tea and he shared with me for, for tea in the morning. What he did was take all of these canned food and he made it into a stove so that we can boil water and make tea. Well, for the fuel, he used the fat, the oil from the uh, fish can. And this is also a small can for the food, for the food in the refugee camp we received from the UN Asia. And he said, make it into a stove. Looks pretty good and it works. So we got good tea in the morning. Uh, when I left the refugee camp, I have a stock plastic bag and I purposely take this with me because this remind me of my past. I don't want to forget you know, the past and I want to use it as remind me that how high I rose in the corporate world and how hell or how wealthy I became, I would make sure that I don't forget my past. I come to work for Johnson Supply and this gentleman named John M. Shang was the founder and president of Johnson Supply. He was a very tough boss, he's very demanding, but he was fair. Once he trusts my judgment, he became my mentor and he promoted me to a corporate officer. I was VP of finance at the time of a billion dollar company. And when he retired, he, he became my good friend. So it, it, the relationship went from a tough boss to kind mentor and finally a good friend. Yeah. And I owe him a great deal. Making the cover of CFO Chief Financial Officer magazine in the title, Read American Dreamer, Team Trend, 10 Years Journey from Boat to War Room. At the time, this is 1991. I was corporate officer and I attend war meeting. So it's pretty nice to have a professional manager put me on a cover and have that title heading. Very nice. I appreciate it so much. Uh, when I was appointed corporate officer, this is my uh, official portrait for the company. So this was a good, nice picture taken by a professional. My next achievement was becoming an American citizen. I made it after a number of years in the US and this was one of my crowd achievement, becoming an American. In my spare time and some time, I participated in a corporate charitable golf. Uh, this one is to support the Ronald McDonald House. I play with my vendors, uh, posing picture with the McDonald's. Well, after so many years, Kathy and I have enough, build enough, uh, what you call it, wealth. So we decided to give it back. And the company, 
organization that play a very important role in our life was Pacific University. So we set up a, a charitable trust to support Pacific University Library forever. We, we put in enough money. So, so the library at Pacific University have operating fund you know, to last for a long time, especially if they just take 4% max every year. And I also had an opportunity to repay the debt I owe two people. On the left is P Professor George Evan, who taught me English at Pacific University. I took English literature from him. This is Professor Evan, then it's me, and then his wife Donna, very nice lady. And invite, she invited my wife, uh, my now wife Kathy to her house for dinner many, many times. And then next to her is Bobby Nickel, who sponsored my sister from a refugee camp and helped her through her education at Pacific University. So in if you go to Pacific University Library, the Tim and Kathy Trent Library, you go upstairs, there's a very special special place that honor Professor Evan and his wife Donna and Bobby Nichols, my, our family, very, very kind helper. And that's the, the rest of the story. Uh, do you have any question? Tim, I'd just like to say thank you. I really enjoyed hearing more about your story and kind of your um, pathway. So I just wanted to say thanks. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Tim, this is Tim Showerman. I just want to urge everybody in the this meeting, if you haven't read his book, get it and read it. It's fascinating. Well, I uh, thank you, Tim. If we can travel and there's no risk, I would go to Pacific University sometime and if Janet Peter can let everybody know that I will be there on a certain day, you can bring the book by and I will autograph it for you, sign it for you. <laughs>